to be joined now by Oregon State head coach Wayne Tinkle and student athletes Warith Alatisha and Jared Lucas and we'll turn it over to questions. Nick we'll start with you on the back left. Wayne last year obviously you, you promised you wouldn't finish 12th after your, you were picked 12th. You're, tie, you're picked to tie for fourth. Any promises this year? Well I can promise you Washington's probably not going to finish where they were picked or Stanford. Um, I mean, I could say I promise we're not going to finish tied for fourth. Probably pretty good odds, but uh, a lot more of that got played out. I promise it wasn't us. It wasn't supposed to be this big rally cry. We just, that's why we didn't put it on the outside of our shooting shirt. It was just kind of an internal deal that got blown up. But uh, I don't know. Maybe you guys are. We're tired of hearing that and said, okay, let's pick them high and see how they handle that. But, you know, the one funny thing is, I don't, I don't know how, I mean, this, especially this year, how do you pick one through 12? This conference is, I think, going to be as deep as it's ever been. And so I don't, I don't envy your guys' positions to do that. But I think you also understand my thoughts on that whole process anyway, I'll, albeit it might be necessary. I get it, a lot of excitement. But, uh, yeah, to me, those things are, Really not, we don't pay much attention to them. Anybody else? We can go back to Nick if he's ready. Wayne, how do you come close to recreating the chemistry from last year? Is it, is it possible or how do, you, how, do you, how do you go about doing that? Yeah, it's tough. It's always a process. Uh, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, it might take some tough losses. Um, you know, you can try to do it with drills and, you know, having events for, you know, team bonding and chemistry building and all that. But really, it needs to be carried out throughout the season, Le learning some tough lessons. Um, you know, we've got a, a, an odd mix, seven returners, uh, six of which had pretty significant roles, um, and then six or seven newcomers. And so you've got to balance... First of all, the returners not not being content with what we did. You know, this our focus has been this is a new year, new team, and then the new guys coming in, wanting a taste of that. You know, thinking that maybe they can come in and, um, you know, do their thing for us. And there's a there's a, a maturation process there too. And I, I kind of joked in the studio that we've got to rub the pretty off of a couple of the guys. And there's always, you know, when you bring guys in um, through the portal or transfers. You know, there's there's some things you've got to work on, even high school kids. And so we're in the middle of that process right now of teaching them how we do things at Oregon State, uh, what our, you know, kind of our pillars are for our program. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're working through those things. But as the season goes on, we've done a pretty good job of developing that. And then asking for leadership from the guys. You know, some of these guys now are stepping into those positions and those roles. Uh, they've got to carry that forward for us. Go up front to Austin first. Hey, how's it going? Uh, Austin Scott with the State Press. Just kind of curious, after making a historic run last year, year, getting into the Elite Eight, how do you sort of respond in terms of, you know, obviously you were ranked 12th in the bracket, and so it's not expected, you know, from an outsider's perspective to get that far into the tournament. So going into this year, what's sort of the mindset in order to match that or even surpass your, where you went last year and how do you kind of approach it this season as, you know, if you were to do it again, maybe it wouldn't be as surprising because you guys just did it last year. So what's kind of the mindset going into this year in comparison to last? You want me to start with that, Austin? Yeah, go for um, it. I think the big thing is to remind our, our, our leadership group what it took. Um, and, and I had mentioned, you know, we, we had some highs and some lows, but some real lessons uh, during last season, I think that put us in position. Um, and so well, those are the things we're harping on. You know, we kept things simple. There was a point we just said, let's, you guys aren't sure what success is. Let's start by 
executing our plan, meaning the coaching staff's plan, not the players, um, outworking our opponent every night out because we can control that, and then enjoying each other because we felt like our guys wanted to be successful. They put pressure on themselves to be successful, but they weren't understanding the steps that it took. So when we started to just focus on those three things, we said it will lead to success. We can't promise when, but it came pretty rapidly. And then that was the theme. Let's, let's just follow the plan, let's work hard, and let's enjoy each other out there. And what that allowed them to do was free their mind up from some of the stinking thinking uh, and we were as confident a group as there was in the tournament there for a while. So harping on those things and then hoping some of the new guys pick that stuff up quickly. Um, I, I think as players, we've always kind of taken um, just to never be satisfied with, with the run we had, you know, and, and kind of people talking about what we did this past season. You can't be satisfied. You can't just sit and, and be happy with last year. Obviously, it was a great year, but here we are um, a month away from a new season. So we got to go out there with the mindset, you know. Um, obviously, you guys talked about it being um, projected or tied for fourth this year. Last year, I um, mean, projected 12th, you know, it, it's – it's a similar mindset. We're going in there to win every game, um, day in, day out, and get better, but it all starts in practice. Uh, like Jared said, uh, never be satisfied. Uh, I think it's up to the returners to uh, kind of pave the way for the new guys and uh, kind of instill like the culture at Oregon State and uh, uh, hopefully get back to the tournament. Okay, We're going to go to Nick and then Eldridge after that. Jared, you've been, this is your third year in the, in the program. Um, if a new one of the new players came up to you before you started practicing and everything and asked you what are they in for what's practice like what's this program like what what would you tell them one well i tell them you know you're with one of the best coaches in the pac-12 uh coach tinkle knows what he's doing um but also you know the way coach tinkle has kind of you know made this program to where it is today um you know we're, we're not the type of team that that you know brings in five stars and this and that you know if coach does it's great we got a bunch of guys that, you know, we want to be here. We want to win. We want to do things the right way. And Coach Tingle preaches all the time. We do things the right way at Oregon State. So just telling them, hey, we do things the right way here. Find a way to get better every single day, and you'll find your way out on the floor. We're going to go to Eldridge in the back right. Uh, Eldridge Ricardo and Pac-12 Network. Uh, first and foremost, Wayne, just congratulations, man, on, on a great run. Uh, Unreal. I, I, I still can't believe it. You know, I called a lot of you guys games over the last five years and if you'd have told me you guys would make it to the Elite Eight, I'd have bet everything I had that you wouldn't. Thanks for your support, buddy. But I don't gamble. <laughs> I'm just being honest, man. I just thought it was amazing. But I want to ask you, and, and I apologize if somebody asked this question because I walked in kind of late, but how do you replace a guy like Ethan Thompson, you know, one of the most underrated players, in my opinion, nationally? I had a chance to watch him every night, so I knew how good he was. But how do you replace a guy like that? Well, I mean, if you, you get your program where it needs to be, it's like you're answering that question every year, right? I mean, when we lost Stevie Thompson, when we lost Trace, now we're losing Ethan. You've got to have other guys step up. Um, and, you know, and also, you know, kind of the uh, – Zach Reichel is a guy that was really our glue guy. And, and Ethan was great. He did so many things well. Uh, he worked on his weaknesses over his time. He became a really good defender as well as a facilitator. Um, Zach was more of the leader, um, the everyday glue guy. So, so it's asking a lot to replace those guys. But, you know, that's that's happened every year. You wonder, gosh, how what are we going to do without this guy? And it's a challenge to these two up here and some of our other vets uh, to take on that responsibility. Of I, I said it at the end of practice yesterday. Hey, leaders can't have a bad day. You know, every day your shots might not be going in, but your voice has to be heard. Um, and if a guy's not going hard in a sprint, they got to jump on him. You know, if, if a guy skipped a line, they know that we don't do that and, and they've got to correct that. One thing we said with this team early on was uh, we all hope to give the keys to the bus to the guys uh, at a certain point in the season. And, and you know, you've got to develop that accountability within. The sooner you do that, the better off your team's going to be. Last year, we weren't able to do that till a little bit later. So we've challenged them with, with that task. If you want to be the ones driving the bus, you know, you've got to go about it this way. So we're just going to hand it off to these guys, demand it from them every day. And just like we developed it through GP2, uh, you know, to Stevie and Drew, to Trace, to Ethan, um, these guys will, will pick up the baton and run with it. Gotcha. I got a question for Jared and one for Warth as well. Uh, 
I'm not letting you off the hook, Jared. I, I, I made a comment to Marla Stewart, who I know you guys know. And I said something about there's no more Trees Tinkle, there's no more the Thompson boys. And then, Jared, you liked the tweet. So what? So what were you trying to tell me? Um, just, just that we have a special team. Um, you know, all those guys you 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 mentioned are all great players. Um, did a lot for our program. Um, but you know, coach just talked about it. Um, next guy up, and, and hopefully being being the leader that I want to be, as well as Warth and a couple of the other guys we have on the team. We got to be able to take the role of, of those guys that came before us. So. I liked it because, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to be that next guy, and I know Ward, Ward does as well and be a leader for this team. I hear you. And Ward, for you, man, I, uh, I apologize because I need to do a better job of my homework. I didn't realize that you were from Nigeria. I know you played at Nickel State in my home state of Louisiana. But just tell me what it's like. You're young, but I don't, I'm pretty sure you know who Hakeem Olajuwon is. He was a teammate of mine when I played with the Houston Rockets. But just tell me what that's like being from Houston, Knowing that dream is from Nigeria, did that have any impact on you playing basketball? Yeah, it did. Uh, Hakeem and my dad are actually friends. So uh, growing up, when I used to hoop a lot at our mosque that Hakeem used to attend, he used to uh, kind of just give me advice and things that I can better in my game. And I mean, from there, I just I just took it from there. That was it. He gave you a little advice heading into the NCAA tournament. What yeah, was it? Yeah, I mean, he uh, I called him on the phone and he just told me uh, when I'm out there. Uh, don't let the uh, lights get too bright. Just be confident and just play my game. And he said, don't foul out. Yeah, that too. <laughs> that too. <laughs> All right, thank you, guys. PJ in the back left. Uh, PJ, Carlissimo, Pac-12 Network. Um, for, for, the, for the players, you know, we like to fashion these stories, and, and I don't know if you can quantify confidence, but if, if you guys can go back, uh, in, in your minds and think of the games in, in Las Vegas and then think of a, as it evolved in Indianapolis. Could you guys feel or sense confidence growing or, hey, that, you know, that's some media nonsense. We're the same every game. But, I mean, you were so much a different team, and it almost seemed like incrementally you, you got better game by game. Did you have any sense of that in Vegas or in Indianapolis as your season Wound down? No, certainly. And I think as that developed, I mean, I've, I've had people that have seen us play a lot comment on how calm I looked and how calm our bench was. Um, and it was really a credit to the guys. They may or may not remember this, but there was a point where we said, if we can just eliminate all the stuff that doesn't go towards us getting better as a team, and just allow the coaches to focus on X and Oing and planning. That, that's when we're at our best. If you guys can do that, then it's going to allow us to stay out of the mix and let you guys play. And we'll, we'll allow you to free your minds up. I mean, you know, we're telling guys, listen, if you're open, fire it. No hesitation. But in order to earn that, we've got to do this and this. The guys really bought into that. They're like, Damn, about time, coach. <laughs> you know, but seriously, that was their mindset. They're like, if we defend our tails off, make good decisions with the ball offensively, we're going to free our minds up. And you saw it because I I can't remember the exact number. Nick may have it, but the amount of threes we made in the Pac-12, I think we averaged ten a game for the season. It was maybe six and a half or something. Uh, and then we shot it really well in the NCAA tournament. So credit to the guys for buying into that and responding when, when the lights were the brightest. Guys, you don't have to agree with him because he's sitting up there either, by the way. Tell me the, what you really Shoot, think. They never do, so. Um, I, th I think that it was, it was honestly before that for us, and, and Coach didn't mention it, but he's mentioned it before. Um, when we played in the Bay Area road trip, uh, I think that was our second to last weekend. We played Oregon at home um, the last week, but we swept the Bay Area. Um, we went to Utah on Monday, beat Utah, three straight road wins. Um, then, you know, we lost at home to Oregon. But I feel that that was when our momentum started. We started to really believe um, that we could do something special after we won those three straight road games. Um, you know, obviously we lost to Oregon, heard them celebrating, um, you know, in our arena, win the Pac-12 championship. And you know, we, we knew our seed in the Pac-12 tournament, so um, we were hoping um, that we'd see him again in the semis, and we got him again. But I think that momentum kind of all started um, that Bay Area road trip and then getting Utah three straight road wins. There was a turning point at, at the Cal game. We, we, um, we had shot ourselves in the foot, um, to coin a phrase, multiple times throughout the year when we became dysfunctional. We didn't follow the plan. We were jacking up ill-advised shots. 
Um, and, and there was a couple of timeouts and halftime at Cal. Um, for the first time in a while, guys would throw a water bottle or drop a water bottle if they were subbed out. Um, Jared took a couple of shots. Monty, you know what you would have called them back in the day. Um, you know, and we, we had to keep coaching them. And, 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 and he'll admit it. You know, I said something like, you know, Jared, you, you got to, you know, watch the, the shots you're taking. Those aren't our kind of shots. And he said, but coach, I think I can make those. And I said, yeah, I want you to take the ones you make, not the ones you just take. And, and he bounced back in the second half. There was another guy, you know, shrugged the shoulders. And we, we had to get after him. And it was the first time in quite a while that, you know what, guys, we're not going back there. This is the part of the season. We've got to really be doing this. And uh, we were really concerned, a couple of the staff members, the next day as we went to Palo Alto on whether we should have practice that day because of, you know, the tongue lashing, I guess, we all gave them. And, and we decided, I said, if we're going to have any re repercussions from that, let's deal with it today, not tomorrow at shoot around on game day. And to the guy's credit, boy, they put all that behind them. There was a, a and it was just a, basically a shooting practice. I plugged my phone into the aux cord. Uh, you'll love this. Started playing some old school stuff back from the 80s, Eldridge. Uh, and it was a relaxed deal, but they came focused. And then we, we, we squashed any of that nonsense. And we were lucky enough to get the win um, at Stanford. And that sort of springboarded things, I think. It was like, all right. Now, Oregon came in and shot the lights out of us the next weekend, but our guys uh, quickly regrouped. And even in the first half of UCLA in the tournament, when they were putting our guys rallied again and again, that was the theme. The guys rallied themselves. They never thought they were out of it. Uh, and then once we got a couple of those, those wins that built that confidence to, to carry us as far as we went. Worth, uh, what the hell made you think you averaged a point again, a little over a point a game as a freshman, and then you were much better as a sophomore? But still, uh, what made you think at Nichols that you could be successful at this level? Uh, playing at a high major level has always been my dream, and that has always been the goal. Uh, my plan was always to do one or two years at Nichols and hopefully transfer. And when I put my name in the portal, uh, Coach Stewart and Coach Tinkle, they contacted me. And just from what they told me, I knew that's where I wanted to be. Tink, last question. I'm surrounded by Grizzlies here. You want to give a, a short version of how much it means to you uh, going into the Montana Hall of Fame? Well, yeah, it's it's pretty special. Um, you know, I'm never big on any of those individual awards and stuff, but uh, I've taken a lot of ribbing the last 11 years since my wife was inducted. Um, and so to be going in there, and being in there with, with not just my wife, obviously that's a sentimental deal, but so many greats, um, it's, just, uh, it's, it's, it's just the thrill of a lifetime. I, I didn't think it would take going to the Elite Eight at Oregon State to get into the Montana Hall of Fame, but we'll take it, we'll take it any way we can get it. But a real, a real thrill for me and my family. Thanks. All right, well, that's all we have time for. Congratulations uh, on the Hall of Fame honor and last year's success. Best of luck this season. Thanks, Jess. Go Beavs. Go